All right, it looks like we're back on. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, for those of you who might be tuning in and don't know who I am or what the church is about, uh, my name is Pastor Quinones, and I'm the pastor of the Northeast Seventh-day Adventist Church on the east, on the northeast side? Yeah, northeast side of El Paso. Yeah, so before we start today's service, um, we're going to allow some time for people to tune in, but we have some quick announcements about the reopening of the church by our head elder, David. David, if you want to come up and give the announcement. Good morning, everyone. We're so glad you could be here to join us this morning on the live stream and those who are present here in our sanctuary. The Lord says, I was glad when we went into the house of the Lord, and I'm so excited to be here this morning, and we're looking forward to, as we voted last week at our board meeting on Sunday, to open the church, and it will be open for the 11 o'clock worship hour, and just for that for right now, and then we'll see how each week goes, and then we'll start to include other uh, facets of the, uh, of the church activities and, and services. All right, now it'll just be the 11 o'clock worship hour. For those of you who are still wanting to remain at home, we will hopefully set up the live stream so you'll be able to watch the 11 o'clock service uh, live at your home with the technology that we have. So we're excited about finally getting back into church and being able to see each other face to face. I'm sure we'll look forward to that day. Of course, we'll need to follow the um, restrictions and instructions that we've been given to uh, maintain the uh, social distance. And it will be recommended that you wear a mask, but you're not required to wear a mask. Okay, We just want to make that clear, but we urge you or recommend you to do so, if you're concerned, specifically. All right, well, glad you can be here with us today, and we look forward to our worship hour this morning. God bless you. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. It is so good. In case you haven't realized, we're back in our church building. And so it's a wonderful feeling to be here today. The only downside to it is that we're missing all of you here this morning. So just want to say happy Sabbath and welcome to our service today. When you come back, you're going to notice that our services are going to be a little different. But you know what? Ch times are changing. And so we just ask the Lord for guidance and leadership and we change with them. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me as we start our study of the word in prayer, please. Our loving Father, we thank you this morning for your Sabbath. And I thank you, Lord, for it's a beautiful day today. Father, I pray for courage and for strength as we continue in these trying times. But more than anything, Father, I pray that you help us to be courageous enough to lean on you and let you guide us and lead us in every step of the way during these end times here on earth as we know them. Father, today I ask for your Holy Spirit to be over me, that I may hear your words speaking to me, that I may share them with your people, Father. I pray for your Holy Spirit in the hearts and the minds and the ears of those that are listening today. Father, bless us in a mighty way, and may we always, Lord, may we always walk in a way that people can see your character in each one of us, Thank you, Father, for your Son who died for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, the series that we are speaking on here at Northeast is I'm Going Home, and it's the study of Moses. And so for the next few Sabbaths, I don't know how long, um, we will be talking about Moses. And prayerfully, we will be... Um, touching on Moses' story, a familiar story, but touching on it in a way that we can make it practical in our lives today. I would like to share with you that when I pick a topic to speak on, I always like to pick a topic that I need, a topic that is near and dear to my heart, something I'm struggling with, something that I need to see. And so when Pastor and David and I decided to speak on Moses, I first thing honestly was story of Moses. You know, everyone knows Moses, a baby born, put in a basket in the water. And then the more I thought about it, the more I prayed about it, I thought there's lessons to be learned in every story in the Bible, no matter how well I think I know them. And so this morning, first to begin with, I'd like to ask your forgiveness beforehand, um, I have been prepared and I have been preparing for, I would say months now, when we first came up with the idea about doing Moses. However, 
So it's not a, a thing about not being prepared, but it's a thing about not being sure. All week long, I've been struggling. I've been struggling with what I had put together. Last night, I went over everything again. Everything I had written down, I went over it, and I was still struggling with it. So I've been praying and praying, and this morning I woke up, and the first thing that popped into my head is, don't even worry about what you've written down. Speak from your heart. Listen to my words. That's what I heard this morning. Listen to my words, and just go with that. So that's what I'm going to do today. And I beg your forgiveness if I stumble or I forget the scripture that I'm supposed to be reading. But it's something that I'm going to do from my heart this morning. It's something that I'm going to share with you that I think we need. I don't think. I know that we need in these trying times today. My brothers and sisters, we're going through difficult, difficult times right now. And I was talking to someone a week ago when we met for prayer here at church. We were talking, there's four of us and we're talking. And we're talking about the difficulties, we're talking about the virus, you know, wearing these masks has become so old. Um, and then we went out to the killer bees and the killer bees kind of just flew right by us. I wasn't even worried about the killer bees, right? And then we go into the turmoil that is just killing our country and our world today. And so this person that was in our prayer group last week says this to us. He said, you know, it might, might sound odd, but I wanted to share with you that I'm happy that we're living through these times. I am happy as hard as they are because that assures me that Jesus is coming very very soon. Amen. My brothers and sisters, isn't that joyous? Amen. You know, it's fearful, but we don't need to be afraid. We need to rely on him. We need more than ever to pull up our pants and say, Father, here I am. Use me. Show me what it is that I need to do. And you know, I want to ask you for a second to pray, 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 pray. You know, we're in the habit of praying for ourselves. But sometimes we pray in general about the rest of, of our families, of, of our neighborhood, our church family, extended families and everything. But I want to ask you to sincerely pray for the state of our people, for our extended families, for the people in this world today. I got a call from a cousin that goes to the Central Church. She asked me if I would contact her grandson who lives in North Carolina. And his question, his concern, isn't that unique. I stopped to think about it, and I think that not only our young people, but this is certainly affecting our young people in different ways than it affects us older people. He has a question about something in the Bible. And I know where that question is coming from. It's the situation that we're living in today. The, the turmoil that's going on about oppression and all of these things. My brothers and sisters, that has to be terrifying to a young person. You know, we older people remember this oppression from before. We, we know what has happened. We know how far we've come. But yet we can still see where we are right at the very beginning still. This hasn't settled anything. So I want to ask you with all sincerity, pray for our young people. You know, pray for the confusion that is assailing them every day about different subjects and different things. So this morning, let's go with our talk here. I'm going home, and my subtitle is, And My Journey Began With Moses. And you may question that subtitle, okay? But let's recap just a little bit about what Pastor Eliab talked to us about last week. He talked to us about the first chapter in Exodus. And he talked to us about Genesis and how the Israelites um, and their state of living came to happen in Egypt. Okay? It was Joseph. Joseph gained favor with Pharaoh and with the leadership of the Egyptian country. And so they loved Joseph, 
And so they were willing to work with Joseph. They were willing to give Joseph what Joseph was asking for. So in Exodus, we see that it continues the narrative that was began in Genesis, the divine promise of a wonderful redeemer. And then we go in through Exodus, and Exodus 1.22 ends with, Then Pharaoh gave his order to all his people that every Hebrew boy was to be thrown into the Nile, but you were to let every girl live. So this is where we left off last week, and this is where we start today. But before we dive into Exodus 2, I want to draw your attention back to Exodus 3.15. And if you don't remember what Exodus, I'm sorry, Genesis 3.15 talks about, then I'm going to plead with you. Take out your Bibles after this, go back to Genesis, and read Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15 is the first mention of a redeemer, of a savior in the Bible. It is the first promise of redemption. And Genesis 3.15, I want to kind of just give you a recap. It's right after um, Eve and Adam disobeyed, and they ate of that beautiful looking fruit that was prohibited to them. So they discover they're naked and they run and they hide and they're hiding. And immediately after that, the Lord seeks them out. And then this is the conversation with, that the Lord has in Genesis 3.15. And I'm going to read to you from the Clear Word Bible. It says, also, I will place a hatred of sin in the heart of the woman and her descendants. And this hatred of sin will find its ultimate expression in one of her offspring. Satan, like a striking serpent, will try to kill him. But as a man crushes the head of a poisonous snake with his bare heel to save his children, knowing he will die, so the Savior will do the same thing. Isn't that beautiful? Here was the Lord promising not only Adam and Eve, he was promising us that he had a plan in place. And what plan was that? It was the plan of salvation. It was the plan that he would send his only begotten son, his beloved son, he would send into this world as a human being to suffer as a human baby, to suffer as a human adult and ultimately pay the ultimate price, die for my sins. So then I want to point your attention to Revelations 12, 7. So we have a promise at the very beginning. And then I want to take you to the very end of God's word in Revelation 12, 7 to 9. And this is from the Living Bible Translation. And then there was war in heaven. Michael and the angels under his command fought the dragon and his hosts of fallen angels. And the dragon lost the battle and was forced from heaven. And this great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one that was deceiving the whole world, was thrown down onto the earth with all of his army. So can you see that theme? It is the theme, the war between good and evil. And so my brothers and sisters, we live in turmoil today. We can see the world fighting. We can see people destroying. We can see people arguing. But my brothers and sisters, I want to point to you to this. This is that great promise of redemption from Genesis 3, 15. And so through the blood of Christ, my brothers and sisters, today I can do anything because Christ gives me the strength to do it. You see, I may live in a world of confusion. Young people, you may be living in a world of confusion, in a terrifying world, in a world where all of this seems natural and normal because that's what you know. Remember, the promise 
in Genesis 3.15. From Eve's family, from her offspring, there will be one that will kill the serpent that through his blood, that through his death on the cross, there is nothing that can come over you. There is nothing that can belittle you. There is nothing, nothing that you should fear. So my brothers and sisters, then we go into Exodus. We go into the second chapter of Exodus. And in Exodus 2, we read about Moses' birth. We read about how there was a couple that had two children already, and then they had this little baby. But they were born, he was born right after, remember 22 in, in chapter 1? So Pharaoh decreed, because if you remember, there, the Israelites, they were living in oppression. They were slaves. They were being worked to death. They were always, always working, and they were treated, treated in the worst way possible. But yet, the Israelites were booming. There were babies being born left and right. And so Pharaoh tells the midwives, you are going to kill all the baby boys that are born. You're going to throw them into the Nile. And if you know your, your earthly history, you know that the Nile was full, may still be full of crocodiles. And so Pharaoh, I'm sure, in his wickedness, in his fear, knew that if the babies didn't drown, the crocodiles were going to get them for sure. So he tells these midwives, okay? So this, this couple has this beautiful child, a baby boy. And they know that they can't hide him for very long, but they hid him for three months. This mom hid this baby. She didn't probably know what she was going to do with this baby, but I'm sure she had time to think about her baby boy and how she was going to save this baby boy. And I'm sure the other um, Hebrew moms did as well. But this mom, this mom was a courageous mom. And so you can see here Moses' life. Moses' life began with God because just as it happens in your life, it happened in Moses' life. Read the story of Moses for yourself. Study the book of Exodus and find out for yourself what happens and how it happens. Because you can see, if you read it, I can stand here and tell you, but I may not So my friends, we're back again. There isn't anything we can control over that. The internet seems to have gone out. But we are persevering. And I just want to say before I continue that um, you can't see them, but we have a wonderful group of men and young people that are working with us here. We have a stage production manager. We, we even had a wardrobe manager this morning. <laughs> and so we have the technicians and everybody that's working hard to get this going. So praise God that we're back on, okay? Mm -hmm. So, Adrian, we're okay? Yes, okay. So as I was saying before this broke out, I don't know how much you heard me saying, but I was telling you how much God was working behind the scenes in Moses' life, and he works behind the scenes in your life as well. So we talked about the midwives, we talked about his parents, and we were talking about his courageous mom. Those of you that have had babies, those of you that have children that you love with all your heart, you can understand and you can sympathize with what I'm going to share with you about Moses' mom. She was a godly woman. She was a courageous woman. And she was going to do what she needed to do to keep her baby boy alive. And I can sympathize with that because my babies I was sharing with you are much older than babies today. But I'll share something with you, okay? Um, our, my eldest son, Mark, moved to Austin, the Austin area, uh, a few years ago. And so in the back of my mind, I always had this thought, you know, because they lived like three minutes away from us before they moved. And so I always had in the back of my mind this thing, you know, they're coming back, they're coming back. And when um, they moved, I worried about where they were gonna live, and I was worrying about jobs, and I was worrying about my grandbabies, 
and I was worrying about so many things. So they've been gone for several years, and a few weeks ago, he sends us a video, and it's a video of a house that they're having built. It's a beautiful house, and I'm happy for them. But Dad talked to them right to him right away, and I didn't want to get on the phone, and they know me so well. So a few days later, I called him, and I said, hey, baby, I just want to say how happy I am for your new house. And he says, woman, I know you so well. I know why you didn't talk to me. You're angry at me, right? Because you know I'm not coming back home. And I said, son, I'm not angry. I'm just sad because I don't want to let you go. I thought you were coming back home, but I am so happy for you. So we talked a little bit about that. So I can certainly understand how Moses' mom felt. You know, taking care of her baby boy and then letting him go. Putting him in a basket in this water and letting him go. So she was courageous and she worked and she trusted God. And then we have the midwives who said, you know what, I'm not listening to what Pharaoh's saying. I'm not killing no baby boys. I'm going to let them live. I'm going to lie about it. And so they lied. They said, Pharaoh, we can't help it. These Hebrew women, they're just so good at having babies. These babies are born before we even get there. So there's nothing we can do. So they lied. They lied a little bit. But God saw that that was favorable. And I don't understand God. I do you, but I try. And so I know that they were faithful women and they were listening to God and they were doing what they thought needed to be done in their trust in God. Mm -hmm. And so then we have a compassionate princess. And this compassionate princess had everything in the world, right? She certainly knew what her dad was doing and what he had ordered about killing all these baby boys. So she's bathing in the Nile. And just in case you don't know, I talked about the, the crocodiles, but you know, the Nile, they separated. The, these were people of influence, people that had everything. So the Nile was sectioned, sections of the Nile were sectioned off so the crocodiles couldn't get into where they bathed and where the princess and her um, servants enjoyed time. So she's there bathing and she sees this basket and she hears this baby cry. Do you think she didn't know that was a Hebrew baby in that basket? I'm sure she knew. And I'm sure she knew why that baby, that Hebrew baby was in that basket. His mommy was trying to save him. So she's courageous and she doesn't care what her dad has said. She takes this baby and first she secures someone to take care of this baby. Do you remember who it was? It was Moses' little sister. And Moses' little sister, you know, I can just see her just hiding around the trees, hiding behind the bushes, you know, waiting to see what's going to happen to her baby. So at the right moment, she jumps up and she says, hey, princess, do you need someone to take care of this baby? Because I have someone that can breastfeed him for you. And the princess says, yes, yes. So they work together and they nurture Moses and they ensure that Moses continues to grow. So the princess has to tell her dad and then she talks to Moses' mom. She says, take care of him for me. You protect him, and you raise him and you teach him and then you'll give him back to me. And you know, for those two women, that had to be the hardest thing to do. Because first, the princess can't nurture this baby by herself. And then the mom has to take care of this baby and teach him about God, teach him about right and wrong. But she knows she has to give up this baby eventually. And so then his little sister's there to take part of it. Do you think that God wasn't guiding Miriam, his sister? God was working behind the scenes. And then there comes Aaron, his brother, and you'll learn more about Aaron later on. But Aaron is commissioned by God to help Moses later on when God says, Moses, you've got to go out and do this. And Moses said, I don't even know how to talk. And he says, don't worry, I got your brother. I got your back, God tells Moses. I've got your brother and your brother's going to help you with all of this. I don't know about you guys, but I'm from a large family. I have five siblings and we'll do anything for each other. And let me tell you, you're going to ask one of my brothers to babysit me and help me with everything. They will, and they'll do it lovingly, but sooner or later we're going to argue. 
because they're going to want to be right. I'm going to be want to be right. And so we'll clash at one point or another. But Aaron says, I'm not going to worry about that. Yes, I'll do it. So you see, my brothers and sisters, God was working behind the scenes. And when God works behind the scenes and when God promises you something, God comes through in those promises. And so the Lord, the Lord is a Lord of compassion. And in this text here, Isaiah 54, 10, it says, And though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken. And my promise, my covenant of peace will not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. You see, in this text, it's talking about you have heard of, of um, uh, earthquakes that tumble hills, tumble mountains. And it says, though the mountains be shaken and they be removed, my promise for you is never going to go away. So you can trust the Lord in what the Lord says. And then we come to the part about Moses was taking, supposed to be taking uh, eventually his people, the Israelites, God's people back home. And in John 14, 1 through 3, God promises us something here. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. And do you think God was saying, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid right now. When he said those words, he was telling you and he was telling me, don't be afraid. Don't let your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, then you also believe in me. And in my father's house, he says, there's plenty of room. There's so many rooms there that there's enough place, enough space for you. He says, and when I go away, I'm going there to make sure that these rooms, that these houses, that this place is sufficient and good enough for you. And if I go and prepare this place, then know that I will come back to you. I will come back to you and we will go home together. You see, God's promises never fail. And my brothers and sisters, I know that we're living at the end of time. We can see that. We can see things happening. We can see prophecy coming true. We can see turmoil. We can see hatred. We can see killings. We can see everything. So my brothers and sisters, we're living at the end of time. And Jesus is there preparing a place for me. He's preparing a place for you. Because you see, he wants me to go home with him. And you know what? I want to go home with him. Yeah. So Moses began this journey, this journey of getting the Israelites away from that oppression. My brothers and sisters, oppression has been around forever. Oppression and, and evil and cruelty has been around forever. I'm going to tell you what compassion is, okay? There's a theorist, a developmental theorist, many theorists about developmental um, but this guy was Lawrence um, Kohlberg, and he described what compassion was, and he said, and he posited it, that um, compassion has to be taught. It has to be taught to our children. It has to be taught to everyone. So compassion, he says, is a sympathetic consciousness of others' distress. And it's the understanding of suffering. So we have to understand what suffering is. And then not only do we do those things, we have to have a desire to alleviate it. And we have to do what we can to prevent such suffering. And if you look at Moses' behaviors, Moses demonstrated all of these things. You know, at first, when Moses started, it was on a small scale. But then Moses went grand and went big. And he did what God was asking him to do. And so let's go to Colossians 3, and I went too far. In Colossians 3.12, and it, this has to be going too fast, I don't know why. Let's go to Colossians 3, 3.12. Let's start in our Bibles there, okay? And let's read what it says there. In Colossians... And bear with me as I go there. Colossians 3.12. It says this. And therefore, as the elect of God, as holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. And then 13 says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. 
If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also forgive. Amen. So you see, these are characteristics. Whose characteristics are they? God. They're God's characteristics. And so my brothers and sisters, if today I call myself a daughter of Christ, then those characteristics have to be mine as well. I have to be kind, I have to be patient, I have to be loving. I cannot be cruel in any aspect of my being. You know, sometimes we say, well, I didn't say that. Well, we don't have to say things. It's the way we behave that lets people know whether I'm truly Christ's daughter or whether I'm following this world and I'm following Satan. You know, I talked a little bit about how we're living at the end of time. And Moses must have felt like his life was at the very end, right? You know, I don't know about you, and there's some of you who are very young, but there have been movie pictures of Moses' life. And the very first one I remember is Charlton Heston, and some of you don't know who Charlton Heston is. But Charlton Heston was the man to play Moses, I thought, right? Mm -hmm. He was strong, and he was handsome, and he was just a beautiful man. And then... <laughs> And then my sons, if they ever listen to this, they say, Mom. So anyway, let's move on. So, but Moses was not portrayed properly with Charlton Heston. You see, Charlton Heston was strong and he was young and he was beautiful. Do you know how old Moses was when Moses realized that he really wasn't Egyptian? I think he knew all along. I think everyone knew he wasn't Egyptian. But when he realizes he's not an Egyptian, he's really a Hebrew, and all of a sudden he can see the pain of his Hebrew brothers and sisters. And so he was 40 years old. So my brothers and sisters, for 40 years he was pampered. He lived a life of luxury. He lived like a royal. He had everything at his disposal. History, history says, suggests that this time period, anyone that was a royal was treated the very best. So Moses had a wonderful education. Moses learned languages. He not only learned Egyptian and he already knew Hebrew, but he learned how to write in hieroglyphics. He knew how to, to speak the languages of the Mediterranean. He was schooled by the very best. He had tutors from a very young age. And so he learned mathematics, he learned geometry, he learned calculus, he learned all of these things. Not only that, Moses became a military man because history suggests that someone in that position had to have been a military man. So Moses learned how to lead as a military leader. So Moses was so well-rounded, right? He was so well-rounded. He wore the finest clothing. He was pampered and he was bathed and he was slathered with oils and he was fed the very best food. He had servants, he had horses, he had chariots, he had everything. But on that time, at that moment when he realizes that his Hebrew brothers and sisters are being mistreated, he probably thought, you know what, this is going to be the end of our existence very soon. So I just wanted to share with you, because we are living in that time, I want to share with you the midnight cry. And I'm not so electronically proficient. I wanted to play this him for you but I have to trust in my <laughs> in my director here and I will get that to you another time but the midnight cry is a song about the end of time and the midnight cry says I hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind and it's closer now than it's ever been I can almost hear the trumpet and I can almost hear Gabriel's sounds, the chord at the midnight cry, because we're going home. My brothers and sisters, we're going home. I want to go home. I'm a stranger here on this earth. I'm a stranger here in, in, in this nation. I'm a stranger here in Texas. I'm a stranger here in El Paso. I want to go home. My home is in heaven. And I hear the sound of the mighty rushing wind. And it's closer now than it's ever been. When Jesus steps out on a cloud to call his children, the dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air. 
And then those that remain will quickly be changed at the midnight cry when Jesus comes again. You see, he's coming to take me home. Remember the promise? He says, I'm going to prepare a wonderful place for you. And now it's time for me to come home. Look up this song. It's beautiful and you're going to love it. So here this screenshot talks about uh, Moses' high rank in his position. But I'm going to ask you to turn to Joshua 24, 14. And it says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And you know, Moses realized, you know, this is my upbringing. I've been real happy, real pampered here. But it's time that I hear my Lord. It's time that I listen to what he's telling me. And so he goes about it the wrong way, right? He's out walking his kingdom. He's surveying everything that belongs to him and his royal family. But then he sees an injustice. He sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. And what does he do? He takes it upon himself to beat up this Egyptian and kills him and then hides him. And I don't know about you guys, okay, but my mind is active mind, and I'm like, you know, I think and I see different scenarios in my mind. So when I used to read this about Moses killing this Egyptian and hiding him in the sand, I'm thinking to myself, wait, all the pictures I see of Egypt show this full of sand, right? There's sand everywhere. I don't know about you guys, but I've never been able to hide anything in sand because it's found very easily. But he doesn't think about that, right? He trusts what he believes. He, he wants to serve the Lord in sincerity and truth. The only difference here though, and this is something for us to remember, okay? So I'm a therapist and I use cognitive behavioral therapy more often than not. Cognitive behavioral therapy says that we think something and these thoughts lead to my emotions. They're either good emotions, there are bad emotions, good thoughts, bad thoughts, but then the key, okay, the key to all of this is my behaviors. I can choose to do better things or I can choose to let my emotions rule and I can do bad things. I had a little girl once and she tells me, I just can't help myself, you know. When I'm thinking of what happened to me, you know, I get all, all gooey. That was her description. I said, tell me what gooey means. She says, well, you know, I get like, I get all wet, you know, and I get, I just feel yucky. That was her description of gooey. She says, so that I have no choice and I have to act and I have to do all of these bad things. You know, I have to wipe everything off the table. I have to kick, I have to scream. I have to do all of these things because you see kids that have been adopted, that have been neglected more than abused even, these neglected kids, they just cannot adjust to a loving home. That's called attachment, uh, reactive attachment disorder. So no matter how good you try to treat these kids, they're good. They're one step ahead of you. They're going to destroy before they're destroyed again. And I've seen these kids. These kids will put poop on the table just to destroy that before anyone hurts them again. They're going to hurt first. And so these kids live in this fear. And so this fear lets, leads them to all of these behaviors. My brothers and sisters, is that so different than you? excuse me, than you and me. It's no different. You see, all of these things, all of these experiences that I've lived lead to these emotions. And these emotions, they make me feel so, so terrible and so horrible and so yucky that then I decide that I'm going to go and I'm going to destroy. I'm going to hurt. I'm going to be cruel because I'm entitled to be cruel to people. I'm entitled to hate people. So I'm going to choose to do that. But you see, Joshua 24, 14 says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and serve him in truth. So my brothers and sisters, I challenge you. Okay? I'm challenging you. Are you a Christian? Do you claim to the world that you're a Christian? Because we love to do that, don't we? We love to say, you know what? I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And you know, I'm different than you. I'm so different. And I know Christ and I know this, and I do that, and I do over here, and I, and I don't do. But then guess what? When you say something that I don't like, 
when you say something, when you do something that not is not in folly with what I believe, guess what? I let that gooey feeling, that yucky feeling come out and my behaviors change. I forget that I just told you that I'm a Christian. I forget that. And then my emotions rule my behaviors and I'm going to destroy you. I am taking you down. I am going to say what I want to say because I want to convince you that I'm right. I'm going to do what I want to do because I just know as a Christian I'm right. Well, guess what? What did we read before in Colossians? If you're my child, if you say you belong to me, then this is what you're going to be. You're going to be patient. You're going to be loving. You're going to be caring. You're going to be compassionate. You're not going to be cruel. And you see, cruelty hasn't changed. It really hasn't changed. Our world hasn't changed that much. What was happening in Moses' time happens today as well. And in 1 John 3, 18 through 19, it says, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. So my behaviors have to be in line with my mouth saying that I'm a Christian. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth so we will be confident when when we stand before god my brothers and sisters there's going to be an answering as we hear the rushing of this wind at this end of time there's going to be a reckoning we have to answer to god did i just say that i was a christian but my entire life has proved that it has been something else when you stand before god what are you going to say? You know, I'll tell you a story. And I don't know who wrote this story, so it's not mine. But there was a, a valley in a mountainous area that was beautiful and peaceful. And there was this beautiful church in this valley. And it had a beautiful organ. And you could hear the organ playing in the morning, in the evening. You could hear beautiful sounds coming from that church. And being in the valley surrounded by mountains, those sounds, those beautiful sounds echoed and everyone could hear. But then one day, that organ stopped playing. The sounds, those beautiful sounds stopped. They were no more. So they went to the pastor in the church. People were going, Pastor, what's going on with our organ? We want the organ. We want the music. We want the beautiful sounds. So they brought someone in to fix the organ. They couldn't fix it. They brought someone else to fix the organ. They couldn't fix it. So on and on these went. So people would come and they'd say they'd fixed it. And someone would play the organ. But the organ was making horrible sounds. They were so sounds, they were music notes that were not in harmony with each other. They were sounds that instead of beautifying their surroundings and calming the people of this valley, they were just polluting the valley with horrible sounds. And so the people want this beautiful organ to play again. So after all of this time bringing in people to fix the organ, try and fix it and everything, one day this old man shows up to the church and he's got his little bag and he tells the pastor, I'm going to fix the organ. And the pastor looks at him a little put off. He looks at this little man, he looks at his appearance, you know, and he says, I've brought in all of these people to work on this organ. What makes you think that you can fix this organ? The little man goes about his business, opens his bag, sets himself up to fix the organ. And he says, well, let me tell you something. He says, I built the organ and I got it to work so that it would produce this beautiful sound, these beautiful harmonies. He says, so if I built it and it's broken, he says, I can fix it. So he fixed it. And once again, this organ was producing beautiful sounds, calming and soothing the entire valley. 
So you see, my brothers and sisters, this story teaches us two things. It teaches us that God can put me back together. So I can say like Moses, I'm not ready to do that. I can go and let my yuckiness introduce my behaviors in a bad way. Or I can say, God, fix me. You created me. You fix me. My God, I have this tendency to be cruel. I have this tendency to want to be right all the time. My God, you created me. Fix me. Fix me. And he will. The second thing about this is my life as a Christian, my brothers and sisters. My life as a Christian. I can proclaim that I am a Christian. But am I strong enough? to hold my tendencies to trust God and let God do what God has to do? Or am I just insistent on creating all of this noise, all of this sound that is nothing but disharmony? Or am I going to trust God to talk to me, to act through me, so that I can be a beautiful instrument, a beautiful sound to everyone around me? That is up to you. That is your choice. You choose to do what you want to do. You know, we live in a society today where we all want to be right. I have to be right. And if you don't think like I do, then you must be wrong. Not only that, I live in a society today that says that if I don't believe like you believe, then you're going to discredit me. You're going to make me look bad. You're going to make me look like I'm ignorant, like I don't know anything, like I don't exist. That's what we do to each other today. So am I going to continue and like that broken organ, pollute the air with nonsense, with cruelty, with hatred, or am I going to let God fix me so that I can do what he wants me? to do. You see, my brothers and sisters, we live in a world of darkness. We live in a horrible world today. And no wonder our young people don't know where they stand, don't know anything but how to destroy, because our, our environment cultivates that. You see, compassion has to be learned. When a baby is born, a baby doesn't know anything about oppression. A baby doesn't know anything about hatred. A baby doesn't know anything about evil. But that baby learns. That baby grows and he learns what we teach that baby. And Moses, Moses had a wonderful beginning because he learned at the hands and, of his mom. His mom had to have taught him about God and God's goodness and God's will. And so Moses had that background already. But you see, I told you at the beginning that God works behind the scenes. He works behind the scenes because he also knew, he also knew that Moses was going to benefit as his leader, having had that military background, having had that royal influence. God knew that Moses was going to be well-rounded and better equipped to do those things. So my brothers and sisters, are you a Christian today? Are you a Christian? Do you want to be the light of this world? Or do you want to be the darkness of this world? Because this world is dark today. And if you don't agree with anything that I've said this morning, then you have to agree that this is a dark place that we're living in today. A dark place where we can step over each other, where we can destroy each other, where we can forget about God. Though we claim to know God, and though we claim and we show that we are Christians, we believe in his word, we believe in what he teaches us. But my actions destroy all of that. So we live in a place of darkness, my brothers and sisters. And I'll end with this short story. This short story, I read it off of um, one of Chuck Swindle's books. So it's not mine either. There was a little boy, and he was from an affluent family, and so he had a nanny. So one night, the nanny is trying to put him to sleep. And he's leaning up against his windowsill, and he's looking out the window. The nanny keeps saying, come on, it's time to go to bed, time to go to bed. And the little boy's just looking. So she finally asks him, she says, what are you looking at? 
And he says, I'm looking at that man punching holes in the darkness. While he was watching a light keeper that was going around lighting the candles around his neighborhood. And so in this darkness, all the little boy could see was this man walking and punching holes in the black, in the darkness. So my brothers and sisters, what do you want to be? Do you want to be a part of the darkness? Or do you want to punch holes of light in that darkness? Do you want to share his light with someone around you today? Because that's what Moses decided he was going to do. Moses decides, you know, I'm fallen, I'm this, I'm that. And at 40 years old, he kills someone and he has to flee because he's afraid. He has to go hide. And so where does he hide? He runs to the desert in Midian. And he spends another 40 years there. My brothers and sisters, I don't know what your desert is today. But Moses' desert wasn't easy after having lived in a palace, after having had everything done for him after eating the best things, after having everything at his disposal. I don't know what that was for him, but I know it wasn't easy. And so today, I don't know what darkness you're going through. I know that there's darkness in your life because that's what this world is today. I know that your darkness isn't my darkness, but it nevertheless is your darkness. So today, I can do two things. I can tell you that my darkness is way bigger than yours. I can tell you that my experience is much worse than yours. And I won't even listen to what you're sharing with me about that darkness. I may not even have any compassion because you see my pain is my pain and I experienced it. So I don't have to understand your pain, but I understand pain. I know what pain is. So I can have compassion today and say, Lord, fix me. Fill me with compassion that I haven't learned. Fill me with that. Fill me with a desire to do something different, Father. No matter if this person, if this person is doing this, I know it's not right. I know it's wrong. So today, Lord, fix me and fill me with compassion. Moses was a compassionate man. And what he hadn't learned, what he hadn't practiced, The Lord made sure that he learned and that he practiced. And so he became an imperfect man, became a wonderful man. And he began my journey into going to my forever, my eternal home. And so today, Lord, I would pray and I would ask you to pray. Let the Lord fix you. Let him fill you with that compassion. Let him tell you what to say. Let him tell you how to act. Don't look at any other heroes. Don't look at anyone else. Look at God. He's your hero. He's your creator. He's your savior. And just like he was behind the scenes working in Moses' life, he works in your life and he works in mine. And this morning, I don't know if you're listening, my dear cousin, but I know the pain that you're going through, just like Moses' mom. You're living this pain with your son who his pain is just unbearable, unspeakable at having lost his baby boy. And those things will destroy us. Those things will take our focus away from God. But today know that we pray for you. And know my cousin, know my sister, that God is working behind Aaron's, behind the scenes in Aaron's life as well. There is nothing impossible for God and God will mend your hearts and he will put you together again. He created you, Aaron, he made you, and he can heal you, he can fix you again. So I don't know what your desert is, I don't know what your darkness is, but I know it's real. Anyone listening today, I know your darkness is real, I know your desert is real, I know your pain is real, and so I part for you as well, and you're in my prayers. Let's hold on to the light in his hands. And let's be that light for El Paso, for Texas, for our nation, for our country, for our world. Let's shine his light on everyone. Not what anyone else is imposing on you, this light. This is the truth and this is the way. And his promise says, I'm gone away, but I'm coming back to take you home. 
and that time is very, very near. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you today. We thank you for Moses' story, and I thank you, Lord, for showing me that an imperfect man can be made perfect, near perfect in you. Father, thank you for showing me that compassion plays the biggest part in being a great leader. Help me, Lord, to stand up to be victorious in you. Help me to stand up for right, for truth, and for anything, Father, that is going to help someone else. Father, bless all of my families and my friends and anyone that has tuned in today. You know what our darkness is. You know what our deserts are. And so, Father, I pray for the strength that we may come to you, that we may leave all of that at your feet, that we may trust you like Moses' mom did, Lord, that we may trust you like Moses did and let you have what is standing in our way today. Father, make us courageous and make us strong. And we thank you for Jesus, for having sent your son to die that I may have eternal life. I thank you, Lord, for, for the home that you are preparing for me. I want to go home. I'm tired, Lord, of being here. I want to be in my forever, my eternal home. I want to sit at your feet, Lord, and I want you to explain to me the things that I don't understand today. But Father, more than anything, help me to be a light. Help me to punch light in this darkness that exists around me today. I thank you, Father, for your love, for your compassion that is unfailing, for your mercies that are new every day. I thank you. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you so much, Miss Knight, for the message and the fact that we're just going to be going home. I just want to uh, just uh, explain again what's happening next week. Next week, we are opening up the churches, and the pews are empty, but they won't be for long. So next week on Saturday at 11 o'clock, like our head elder said, that our church is going to be open just for the just for the sermon and divine worship hour. And after that, we will be going out to the communities again next week, and we'll be feeding uh, those who are hungry, those who are in need. So if you are in need and you may have stumbled on this video, uh, just message us privately on our Facebook page. That way we can save you a box of food or fresh produce. Or if you are needing anything else, we'll see what we can do to get you those items as well. So next week again, to, next week at 11 o'clock, our church is going to be reopening. And right after church service, come prepare with some sneakers or and, and, and some, some nice walking clothes because we're going out to our community and we're going to try to feed them as well. So I hope to see you next week and thank you for tuning in. Happy Sabbath, everybody.